Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul Worship His holy name Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness, I will keep on singing reasons for my heart to find bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul i worship his holy name sing like never before oh my soul i worship your holy name and on that Day when my strength is failing draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forevermore bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul Worship His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I worship Your holy name I worship Your holy name I worship Your holy name the Lord on this his day I trust that you did and I want to thank Jimmy for being here we were Ben and her upholding Moses hands today we had a great time in the Lord didn't we I mean he was on his side I was on my side I was doing my thing and he was following the Holy Spirit doing his thing but by the eyes of faith we know God heard us and I thank the Lord one of the things Jimmy might not have heard on the news is that they have not been able to advance toward Kiev yet. And we pray that they will not. And they um, count on the casualties on the other side. The Russians have suffered 4,500 deaths. Mm -hmm. It's Goliath facing David, David facing Goliath. And it seems like David is holding strong. Yeah. David is a man of covenant. And the president of Ukraine is a person of covenant. And so let's uphold them. Let's pray, be part of that great praying army as you go. You know, I had an idea because I started this. Since I started watching the news more, whenever I saw any of the refugees or the president, I will lift my hands and say, Lord, protect that one, provide that one, and pray a blessing. You know, it seems like through the you know, media, we can just be there to bless that person we see on the screen. And if we all do it, I tell you what, we're going to see marvelous things. And, you know, today I, I didn't want to cry, but my heart was so heavy. And sometimes I get, ex you know, blamed for not completing my story. And I said that the reason why I think I felt so um, burdened for uh, the Ukrainians and those being separated from their loved ones is my own family's example. 
My mother and her four siblings were here when Pearl Harbor was bombed. My dad had immediately gone with the Japanese American soldiers to the mainland and to be sent to Italy. And my grandparents with four other siblings, I believe, um, did not know how his children, my grandfather did not know how his children were faring here, and we didn't know, my mother did not know uh, how they were faring there. But I didn't tell you the good news. Through all this, in fact, my dad came back to the war and he says, I know nobody thanks God for the war, but I kind of do because it, because of the war I got saved. My dad, because my mom had, you know, Jesus had found my mom, became her best friend, and she became a prayer warrior. My dad's platoon in making the landing in Italy, and you know the history of the 442nd, they were the most highly decorated because they had the most casualties. My father earned a purple heart and a bronze star, and he was left for dead when most of his platoon was wiped out that day. But God. Somebody stumbled on his body and said, if you don't move at nightfall, we'll come and get you. And he was rescued and one of the first to be sent back. My grandfather, on the other hand, because my mom was praying for them. You know, it, the Okinawan War was about the last war of the Second World War. It was one of the most fierce wars of the Second World War. Many casualties, so many, a couple of hundred thousand uh, Okinawans, I think, were killed or wounded during that time. But because America, you know, is an, a Christian country, my father said when he was wounded and was shipped back to North Africa, to Casablanca, to the American hospital there, he was amazed that a wounded German soldier was given the same treatment, same food, same courtesy, and he wondered about that. And when he became a Christian, he said, that's the difference. We love our enemies, we take care of them. Well, when our enemies, um, when their, America was going to um, take Okinawa and fight for Okinawa, uh, they dropped leaflets telling the natives, the landing is going to be in, uh, in the south, in the north, so go to the south. And somebody told the natives that that's the trick of the enemy, so they fled to the north where the landing was and fierce fighting, so many of them were killed. But my grandfather had a jacket that said, Made in America. And as the soldiers were landing near Itoman, those of you who've been to Okinawa, central Okinawa, he ran toward them and he spoke in his pidgin English. <laughs> I've been to America, I love America, I will help you. And he became kind of an interpreter for them. So her whole family was safe and they had enough food to eat and a comfortable place to stay. So I do know prayer works. And so even if you don't have a relative there, when you see them on the screen, pray a blessing of protection. And we are gonna to continue to pray for them tonight and every noon, Monday through Friday, during Lent, we're going to pray for the Ukrainians. And if you know of any Ukrainians living here, we ask that you invite them to come here. So we're going to, in this opening prayer, also pray for Rani as she will soon be on the way back and we're gonna have the memorial service for her son. We'd like to remind all of you that Friday will be our family night and potluck at six o'clock. We hope all of you will be there. Let's just welcome the presence of Pastor the Lord. Um, Ron is going to have an operation on his back on Wednesday too. When Ron, Ron Yamakawa yeah. is having a procedure on his back, let's trust the Lord for that on Wednesday. Father, we thank you. You're a great, big, wonderful yes. God. There is no distance in prayer and you have united us by the blood of Jesus Christ, which we partook of this morning during communion. You've made us one family. And so we thank you that as a father, you give us provisions to call upon your name, your mighty name, and we have resources in the heavenlies to protect us. And so we pray again for the president of Ukraine. We pray, Lord, 
confusion in the camp of the enemy. We pray for supernatural intervention. We pray for supernatural provision and protection for our brothers and sisters and all of the Ukrainians there. We pray that you will watch over them and comfort and strengthen them, guide them and protect them. We give you thanks, Lord, for the miracles we've already received. And Lord, we do thank you for your provision of healing for us. We pray for healing for Ron, and we pray that you will be with the doctors and nurses to give them divine wisdom to do a perfect job for whatever they have to do and that there be no setbacks or complications. We also pray for Ronnie that you'll continue to comfort her and be with her and her family as they come back. Help us as church family to be a comfort to them. Now we give you this time. Teach us your ways, Holy Spirit. Lead and guide our teacher, Lord, to show us what you want us to do for your kingdom work. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing a couple of songs and praise the Lord. Amen. He is Jehovah, God of creation. He is Jehovah, the God Almighty, the Bum of Gilead, the Rock of Ages. He is Jehovah, the God that dealeth thee. He is the great I am, the God of Abraham. Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace I am, the God of Israel, the everlasting one. He is Jehovah, the God that dealeth thee. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. He is Jehovah, Lord God Almighty. He is Jehovah, the God that healeth thee. He is your provider, Jehovah Jireh, God of salvation, God of Messiah. His Son is sent to you and testified of him. He is Jehovah, the God that healeth thee. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. He is Jehovah, the God Almighty. He is Jehovah, the God that healeth thee. He is Jehovah, God of creation. He is Jehovah, Lord God Almighty. The bomb of Gilead, the rock of ages. He is Jehovah, the God that healeth thee. He is the great I am, the God of Abraham. Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace I am. The God of Israel, the everlasting one. He is Jehovah, the God that healeth thee. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. He is Jehovah, Lord God Almighty. He is Jehovah, the God that healeth thee. He is your provider, Jehovah Jireh, God of salvation, God of Messiah. The Son he sent to you and testified of him. He is Jehovah, the God that he led thee. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah. He is Jehovah, the God Almighty. He is Jehovah, the God that he led thee. He is Jehovah, the God that he led thee. your soul, or your spirit. Amen. He is everything, right? He is everything. He meets all of our needs. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's everywhere all the time. In times of war, in times of peace, he is God. And so we just know that during these challenges, God is going to show up. Do you know that the prayer request of these Ukrainian Christians, as they were asked by the CBN news reporter, they said they didn't ask for food or protection or to win the war. They say, pray that we'll be strong to make God known among the people. Wow. We need to stay focused. Well, we've got tonight 
a very special couple here. They went up to the mountain and got back in time, and we love them so much. We're so glad that they are here. It's just too short. They're just here for a week. But Cuddy is, has been giving us insights and vision casting uh, with all of us who are leaders and the students in our Bible school. We've been very inspired because I believe this is right on with what God has been showing us. The most important thing is not to entertain our young people. It's not to make the programs exciting. It's to teach them how to live out their own faith in everyday circumstances. Cuddy grew up in Newport News, Virginia. His dad is a retired engineer from the Newport News shipyard where for 63 years, was that a typo? No. 63 years, yes. he designed submarines and aircraft carriers for the Navy. Wow, he must hold a record. He, he's, close. he's close to holding a record. 63 years designing submarines and aircraft carriers. Petty's education, he has a bachelor's degree from the best college in the world. Guess what? Emmanuel College in Franklin Springs, Georgia, where they, my family members, and several, quite a few of our young people here went and got educated. Emmanuel College, he got his master's degree in theology from Regent University in Virginia. And Linda and Cuddy met at Emmanuel. That's a good place to meet, you know. And when you're young and have the same calling, what a wonderful place. And they've been in ministry over 28 years together. 20 of those years were spent in local church youth. They do have three cats. <laughs> Mamba, Hansi, and Franzi. And you know what? I'm number three in Toby's life now. <laughs> Carol comes first, of course. And when Linda interfered and went to Toby and cuddled him, he doesn't even look at me anymore. <laughs> so maybe I'm not even number three. But they say, you know, animals know who love them, and that was really sweet. But Pastor Cuddy, God bless you. Thank you for blessing us tonight. Amen. Amen. Let's give him a hand. Amen. Good evening, everybody. We have visited the um, lovely mountain state park. Um, I... I uh, I asked you, did you know earlier that you have a 10,000-foot mountain that way? And uh, we got to see it today, along with some others. And the wind wasn't bad. It was, it was actually pretty, pretty, pretty pleasant. I'm glad we got to do that and see um, the beauty of this island, but more importantly, the beauty of God's hand. Gosh, it is beautiful, man. It is so beautiful. Once again, it's a pleasure being here tonight and uh, so thankful for opportunities like this. I don't take assignments like this. Uh, I took them real serious, and, and um, just, just a privilege to talk to you guys and to share my heart and uh, to do it in a way that you, um, you sense that this is from the Lord, not from me, and that uh, I, want, uh, I just want to speak uh, tonight a little bit about faith and faith development. We talked this morning about passion, and I'm a big believer in that. I'm a big believer that uh, we should have the passion of God in our hearts and our lives as we, um, as we live our lives and people should see us passionately in love with Jesus and that should make the difference, uh, I believe. Tonight I want to talk a little bit about faith and, and the flow of faith and, and real particular, I'm going to give you some you know, real particulars that I think are essential to faith development. Some of this is going to be remedial, but ultimately I think uh, the point is this. Um, I believe that God wants every single one of us that's in here this room tonight and everyone watching on Facebook to have a gushing kind of faith, a gusher of faith. Uh, when I was a youth pastor, um, we used to take our kids uh, whitewater rafting. Uh, if you've ever been in any rafting, um, uh, it's quite adventuresome. Uh, the way they rank them is class one to class five, and in West Virginia, um, uh, right around Labor Day, they open up the Gauley Dam, the Somerville Lake, and those Corps of Engineers op open that 
that, that water and release that water into the Lower Gali River, and that becomes the hot spot in the world to raft on. It's, it's pretty amazing. If I had a picture tonight, I would show you a vat that's probably about, uh, gosh, about 10 foot tall and about, you know, five foot wide. And it's when they're releasing that water, it, it, it just looks like a straight line of white water shooting out of it. And it sounds like a jet taking off or landing. And it's just a gusher. That's the picture I want you to see tonight. That's the kind of gushing kind of faith that God wants you to have. That's the kind of faith that God wants your teenagers to have. That's the kind of faith that God wants your children to have and your family to have. So I want to talk about that tonight. Um, um, in, in reference to that, um, we would get in these rafts together. And we would get, uh, there'd be, I don't know, six or seven rafts full of teenagers and, 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 and guys. And even, even Linda would get on in those rafts and go down there with us. Um, I had a picture uh, of her um, in one of us, one of our first trips when we did that, and she had a smile on her face. And um, she reminded me when we were looking at that picture, I had, a bit, I had a bit blown up, and it was just like, yeah, look at that. We're going down the river together in class five rapids, and, you know, hopefully we make it to the end. Um, and uh, she, uh, she had a smile on her face, and she reminded me, she said, uh, Cuddy, that is not a smile of I'm having a good time. <laughs> That is a smile of, oh, my Lord, what have I done, and why am I in this boat? Um, but you know, as you're navigating um, rapids, uh, you need a team to do that, and we're going to kind of talk a little bit about that um, tonight. But I actually think there's th this expression, that uh, truth that God is wanting for uh, you and your faith to flow, and he wants it to be high, and he wants it to be strong, and he wants it to be exciting, and he wants it to be thrilling. He wants that just as that water is coming out of that bottom of that dam and, and that lake and that thing is gushing and making an incredible sound, that's the kind of impact and the faith that God wants you to have for 2022. That is the picture of it. And coming out of some stuff that has kind of like maybe sidetracked that or sidetracked your faith, and, 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 and maybe I'm talking to a group that, that, that needs to hear this message tonight. If we're going to have... A life that flows with faith, we're going to have to have some um, confident catalyst for that to happen. That's what I want to talk about. This has kind of been God's plan from the beginning. Um, from the beginning, the flow of faith comes out of relationship to trust Him and for us to trust God and, and to trust in God. God's been building uh, this trust from the fall of the Garden of Eden, you know, when he, when he commissioned Adam and Eve to be there. And He basically gave him a directive and said, hey, you can have anything in the garden, but don't touch that. But... But he was just at wanting them to trust him and trust in what he tells them and what he said to them. Um, he's not trying to keep something from us. He's not trying to keep something from you. Um, but rather he is calling out and he's beckoning and he's, he's calling you tonight to completely trust him. Uh, to believe in and trust what he says. And... Um, and what he wants to do and what he wants to build in us. The ultimate faith question for us today is, will we follow that? Will we actually follow what God wants us to do? And can we trust him? Will we trust him? If 2022 is going to be this exciting life of, fl of uh, flow of faith, we're going to have to allow some catalysts to help us. So here's, here's what happens. Like many pastors and many theologians and many teachers and many directors of schools, and uh, they all kind of have their own way to help you develop your faith, okay? Um, there's a lot of different approaches to this. There's nothing magical about it, but I'm going to give you five um, that I think are essentials in, in, living, in living in faith. Um, I'm going to talk about five of them for, for faith to actually flow. Some of you um, will identify with them. Some of you uh, tonight may only connect with a few. Some of you may connect with all of them. I don't know. My, but my prayer is that as we allow God to do something in us and to allow our faith to, 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 to rise up and to be a gusher kind of faith, I think you're going to need these in your life. It's, so let's talk about them. The first one is very, very simple, and, and you know this already. Um, it's the teaching of God's Word. Um, in Matthew 7, 24, th this is what the writer says there in the gospel. Therefore, everyone who hears the words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. That's Jesus talking. Psalms 33, 4 says, For the word of the Lord is right and it is true, and he is faithful in all he does. We can trust God's word. 
For the word, uh, Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the word of God is alive and it is active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of our heart. The teaching of God's word. The teaching of God's word. John 7.38 says this, Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them so we talk at the church i i attend and i'm on staff at we talk at tc we talk there at the capital church about this thing all the time we are a bible believing church and everything that we do is connected to the word of god everything that we do um, business meetings open with the word of god staff meetings open with the word of god um, Meetings with our kids, meetings with our, our teachers, meetings with strategic planning, any kind of planning at our church that we have, it, gets, it opens with the Word of God. Uh, and, and to be honest with you, sometimes when I, I can't, believe it or not, there's a lot of times you, you, know, you, you, you get an announcement or an email or a text message about, about staff meetings. And sometimes in the past in other churches that I've been to, I was like, oh man, I'm going to a staff meeting. <laughs> This is going to take a while, but man, our staff meetings, um, our pastor, he loves the Word of God, and he loves preaching the Word of God. So every time that we have a staff meeting, he opens that Bible, and he just pours the bread of life on us. Before we talk about the business, before we talk about what's going on, he, sp he is spilling the Word of God, and I'm telling you, there's something about that. There's something about the, the, the faith development in us when we connect with the Word of God. So I want to encourage you, if, if, if you're in a place in your life that that's not happening, I want to encourage you tonight that, that somehow or another, you need to actually become a part of a reading program. You need to actually get a devotional Bible. Um, I would encourage you every time that you have your meetings and every time you get together, and if you already do it, praise the Lord. If not, I would say somehow or another, open with the Word of God and let God do that. It will be a faith guider. The Bible says it guides the path. It's His Word that guides our path in those things. We were talking this week about the Reveal study, and, and, and a secular organization went and studied thousands of churches across America. And when they studied, when they studied these churches, what they found out, they, they came back with all this data, and they, they talked to the, 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 the pastor of this church and the staff of this church. And this, the Reveal study was basically given to us. And, and you got 2,000 youth pastors there, and we're listening to what the Reveal study is saying. But basically, it was saying, like, look, it's like you. You guys, one of the main things that jumps off the chart whenever you're talking to people in their faith nurture that they want and that they need. Number one, in this study, this was a secular group that was studying churches, said to those churches, you've got to get them the word of God and you've got to get them to, in truckloads. And I, I, even, I would even say like, you know, sometimes churches are like stopping things and, and rearranging things. I would say if churches could get back to the place and we can get to the back to the place that we have different avenues and different and different places that people can connect with the word of God. Now, in, the, in, in COVID, it became quite difficult. But even still, even through connecting on Zoom meetings and, and actually on Facebook and all that, all, all those kinds of things. The point is, we need the word of God in our lives if we want our faith to grow. We're going to need it. We're going to need it. And the Reveal Study guys said to that church, you got to get the Word of God to these people. Every, everybody that you want to see have a faith development, a process in their life, they've got to get the Word of God in them. Get it to them in truckloads. Get, it, get them the Word of God. It also said this. It also gave basically a directive to parents. Like, you know, parents, according to that study, and actually according to Deuteronomy 6, Parents, parents are, are the main faith nurturer for their children. The, the Reveal study said, you know, parents, they're looking to the parents to do that. So I want to encourage you parents tonight. If you want your child to grow in God, you got you got to connect with the Word of God, and you got to help them connect to the Word of God. Now, I remember as a little boy, my dad did that for me and my brother. I remember the little stories, and I remember our little prayer time. And, and, but I remember distinctly him breaking open the Word of God and us doing family devotions for us. And I remember, I remember many nights, well, you know, sometimes we use it as an opportunity to try to stay up later. I don't know if kids do that now. 
But we were like, Dad, read us another one. Read us another one. Oh, tell us about so-and-so. And he finally got what we were doing. And he was like, y'all go to sleep. So that's what we did. Um, for most people to have a gushing kind of faith, they're going to have to clothe themselves in God's word. They're going to have to have that. And the great thing about God is that God loves you so much that this, the word of God itself even tells us that God's word, that even in God's word, it tells us about God himself. And that word, those words that describe God, he's invisible. He's un, you can't even know him. His ways are higher than our ways. He's so far above us. He's so eternal. We can't even see him. But the wonderful thing is, is God accommodated himself and he accommodated himself in this book with words that you and I can understand. The theological term is linguistic accommodation. But what God did was he put himself in this word. And John chapter one tells us that this word right here, this is the spoken word of Jesus. If so whenever you get this in you, you're getting Jesus in you. And the more you get Jesus in you, the more you're going to become like Jesus. Yes. And the more you become like Jesus, the more faith you're going to have. Yes. And that's how that works. Yes. There's no shortcuts to becoming a person of faith. There's no shortcuts there. So I want to encourage you tonight. I want to, I want to encourage you tonight. Let the word of God be a faith guide to you. Let it light your path. Let it speak to you. And I'm not talking like checking the box here. I'm talking about we, we and, and many times as a youth pastor, we tried our best to get the word of God to kids as best we could. And, and there were many times when I was preaching a sermon or something like that. And, 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 and God was and the spirit of God was moving and it was touching kids hearts and and kids. We could see kids were in it and they were with me on it. I would on a lot of occasions I'd have no cards like crazy like like index cards big huge index cards and I would go th after services on the night and I would hand those note cards out and I said write those scriptures down write them down write them up put them up where you can see them I know that every time you get ready you know guys get ready and going to school different than girls I understand all that um, you know the guy is probably going through his room and sniffing something that smells clean and away we go but girls probably are a little different than that um, matter of fact, if you've ever visited a, 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 a ninth grade or tenth grade boy's home, usually there's paths in the room, and there's clothes on each side of the paths that's so just laying there. But but I would tell them, I'm like, put it while you're brushing your teeth and getting ready. Put that scripture up. Read that scripture. Memorize that scripture. We would give them like little pocket things, and we would put pat, we, we, memorization cards, and we we just memorize these passages of scriptures, guys. Get the word of God active in your life. Get the word of God. Get a working knowledge of the word of God because it will grow your faith. Yes. It will grow your faith. Amen. The second thing that I believe to have a gusher kind of faith is um, God-directed relationships. In your relationships, in Philippians 2, 5 says this, with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus. You're journeying together in relationships because God has directed those things. Ecclesiastes 4, 12, that one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, a quarter of three strands is not quickly broken. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another person. There's something about the right kind of relationships that God directs us that helps grow our faith. A, a God that is sovereign. He knows everything about you. He knows the beginning, the middle, and the end. And he knows the people that he needs to bring into your life to help your faith grow. And it's almost like God orchestrates those things to happen. Now for me, I have my list, and you probably have your list too. And I'm not talking, I'm, I'm talking about people that God led into my life that made a difference in my life. I remember, I remember, my, I remember, I remember the day my, my church hired a youth pastor. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know anything about him. He had red hair. He was, I knew he was from the beaches of North Carolina. That was about it. That was about it. But I remember, I remember I got sick at home and I couldn't come to church or something. And all of a sudden, my mom knocks on my door at, at my bedroom and she's like, hey, Robert. She says, Robert. She said, Robert. She's like, um, Dennis is here to see you. And I was like, 
who? And he's like, yeah, Dennis is here to see you. And I was like, why? <laughs> I was like, I don't know why. He just wants to see you. I'm going to let him come back. So he comes back. And man, he sat, he sat in my room and he just sat there and he was just talking to me and just cutting up and just, you know, just visiting with me, just building a relationship with me. That, from that day on, it changed my life. That guy allowing the Lord to work in faith development through him. And you know what? We talk now after 38, what, 38, some 35 plus years of being friends, we still talk to each other almost every single week. I've preached at his church numerous times, done stuff with him, our, our relationship, and God orchestrated that in the moments of my life. And it wasn't that they, that they were the catalyst for that, they were, the, they were the relationship development for that, but in that relationship moment, there was incarnational meetings with God. That was the difference in my faith. Another person that came into my life, I went to Emmanuel College, and Ron White was the manual director of, sing, of singers, and he became, a, he became a person in my life that, that it was like God was like, okay, I got the next guy for you. His name's Ron White. And then actually at Emmanuel College, I met Matt Bennett, and many of you know Matt Bennett, or you know, you know what he does, and he's the son-in-law of Garnet. Uh, he married Garnet, Garnet, Dr. Pike's daughter, and, and I know them. I know them very well. We've been lifelong friends. And, and, and we talk about the things of the Lord and we talk about what God is doing and we talk about, it's always about what God's doing and what God wants to do and we have fun and we do life together. Um, uh, Dr. Gardner, I work with Dr. Gardner in Burlington. God, when I finished at Regent University, I was wanting to bounce in my first church and I got there and I was working with Dr. Gardner and he, I caught him at the later end of his years, but I, I tried to squeeze everything I could squeeze out of Dr. Gardner to learn from him relationally about faith and what it means to serve God as a pastor and 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 I went and worked with Dr. Uh, uh, and Ernie Trueblood in, in, in Virginia and I went and worked with Joel McGraw in, in Huntsville and 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 these guys and I worked with Pastor Jimmy Whitfield in Goldsboro North Carolina and I worked with Billy Rose and and all along the way these guys are connecting me and divinely helping me grow my faith why because God doesn't he doesn't want you on your faith journey alone he wants to connect you with the right kind of people. And if you let God bring those people into your life, it will change your faith. It'll change it. God brought these people into my life to help grow my faith stronger. What's your list look like? Do you, do you remember? Do you talk to the people that helped you? Are you still in those kinds of relationships? Because what I find often... What I find often is people are trying to work their faith out by themselves. Now, I can tell you, when you're going down a, a, the Lower Gully River in West Virginia and you're trying to navigate that in a kayak or, a, or what they call duckies by yourself, it is, a, it is a whole lot more difficult to try to navigate down that versus me being in a boat with six or seven other people and we're doing that navigation together. God orchestrates those things, and God wants to bring the right kinds of people into your life. God knows who you're going to listen to. He knows who you will not listen to, but he knows who you'll listen to. And in his sovereignty, he orchestrates those individuals who you need to connect to to see your faith explode. He knows those things, and he wants you to have a gusher kind of faith. I can't count how many people that I talk to who had people who tell me their story about a certain person or a group of people or a couple that reached out to them and somehow or another their interaction with them connected and jump started their faith. So let God direct the right kinds of people into your life. Same thing with your teenagers. Your teenagers need the right relationships to help their, great, their faith grow. And I can tell you that there's a lot of teenagers that have a lot of relationships that are trying to sabotage their faith. And if they're not hanging around the right people and, and, and they don't get God-directed relationships in their life, their faith is going to struggle. So we got to get them in. We got to get them around the right people. We got it. Moms and dads, hear me tonight. You got to get them around the right people so that those people become influences or faith in their life. Can I get an amen there? 
The third one tonight is your faith grows and flows with private spiritual disciplines. There's no secret in that. Colossians 4, 2 says, devote yourselves to prayer and be watchful and thankful. Romans 12, 12 says, be joyful in hope and patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That's 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Keep this book of law always on your lips, meditate it on day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. That's Joshua 1, 8. Your faith grows when you begin to allow spiritual disciplines to become a part of your life. That's just connected. We're talking about Bible time. We already covered that. But prayer time and meditation time, the things that Pastor Barbara's talking about, are so important. They're so important for you. There's, so, there's, this, there's this connection that happens between you and what God wants to do through you, and that is accomplished in prayer. Our church does 21 days of prayer and fasting. We do it twice a year. We do it at the beginning of the year, and we do it in August. And it's just a time of prayer and focus and praying for things, praying for people, praying for healing, praying for, for addictions to drop off people, praying for the future, praying for vision. Everything that we have connects us because when we pray, we get the heart of God. When we pray, we get the right focus. When we pray, we get connected to what God wants to do. It's a connection. Or maybe solitude. Now, the interesting thing is I've seen some guys on the island doing solitude, but I don't know if it's, they're doing it for Jesus or not. They're laying on benches or they're, in there, they're, they're doing other stuff. Um, matter of fact, the, the, um, the crazy thing is uh, I saw Jesus last night. Do you know he's in Maui? He's riding a bike over in Lahaina. And he's got a sign that says, I am Jesus. I was going to talk to him, but I thought, nah, I better leave that one alone. But I learned that. I learned that. He's, Jesus is in Maui, which makes a lot of sense. But anyway, solitude, um, fasting, fasting, where you're not dependent on, on natural food, but you're dependent upon spiritual food. And it becomes a part of your life to grow your faith. Or journaling, writing out what God is doing. And, and because I, I can tell you, like, some of this stuff is so vitally important because people need to hear what God is saying to you. And people need to read those things. One day, we're all going to be pushing up daisies. And it's going to be wonderful for us to be able to look back on your lives that you've journaled and you, we've seen the high, we'll see the highs and the lows. I, I told a, a pastor friend of mine, Mark Whitfield, I told him, I said, Mark, your dad's getting older. And I'm like, he is so full of wisdom. But he's a pastor's pastor and he, he's an awesome guy. And I worked with him eight years. Matter of fact, I was in Huntsville and took a pay cut. To, I wanted to work with him so bad, I took pay cut to go work with him. I'm like, he's so full of wisdom. And I'm like, what you need to do, man, I told him, I said, you need to get your dad and you need to get him in a room and you need to start getting a recording of all the wisdom that he has concerning God and people of God and church and what it means to follow the Lord. I mean, he's full of it. He put in 40 plus years in the local church and it's full of the wisdom of God. But if we don't have a record of that, those, those are missed opportunities for us, for people like you and me, to, to hear that. That's why, that's why, you know, podcasts are jumping off the, off the, you know, everybody's got a podcast, which I think is wonderful. I think it's great. But I hope that the right motive is not just, I want you to come hear me. I hope the motive is, I want you to really hear me what God's doing in me. That's a big difference. So I would just say, encourage you, like, where, where is your Bible time? Where is your meditation when, when, when the pastor of this church calls you to prayer, are you here? Are you, or if you can't make it here, um, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe you can be where you are and maybe take some time in your work to, just to pray. I mean, I, you know, if, if I would even say, man, if, if we're not praying for Ukraine right now, I would actually kind of check where you are. I mean, if, if, if seeing the pictures of what's going on in Ukraine don't touch your heart and don't move you to some place... I would say we probably need to have a conversation, a serious one. Like people are hurting, people are dying. And I'll even say this, even before Russia ever walked in Ukraine, people are dying, people are hurting. 
Guys, I will tell you this. Even before, even before Russia ever stepped a foot into Ukraine, people in Maui are dying. People in Maui are hurting. And people in Maui are needing someone to pray for them and reach out to them and love them. You know, it's not just the next thing on the news that, that, that you should be, that, that we'll be connecting to, but it's like, where are you in your, does God can, when you pray and you connect to God, he can touch the heartstrings for you. And he, could, he can call you and be insensitive to, to prayer in your life. The fourth thing is life events. James 1, 3 says, Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking anything. There's a process there. Just through our life events, God can cause our flow, the flow of tremendous faith to explode. Trusting becomes deeper. The wise and the wows are met with a rock-solid, unwavering commitment, and our faith grows deeper. Our confidence in Christ grows through how we respond to life's circumstances. And in those moments, faith explodes and grows and it flows. And I'm talking about regular, ordinary life circumstances. Like the loss of a loved one. Maybe some babies are being born. Maybe some families are starting. Maybe a wedding happens. Maybe, maybe through a blessing that comes unexpectedly. I remember being at Emmanuel College in, in my early faith development. Um, there's been many since, but I just remember this one was the one that kind of like, so I was at Emmanuel College, and, and I would go work in the Salvation Army up in, up in uh, D.C., and I did it for four years or five years. My, la my, my last four years, I was, I was a coordinator for the Dumfries and the Alexandria, Virginia area, which is right outside of, of D.C., and I was in charge of like the Kiet clubs, and they would do canned good drive pickups and stuff like that, and we would go by and, 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 and meet with them, and then um, so we wrapped up, and I, I was at Emmanuel College, and I told these guys the other night, which was quite funny, I, have a, I had a 64 Mustang that was my dad's. He bought it brand new in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and when he was in the military, and I still have it today. And I drove that thing all over the southeast when I was at Emmanuel, but the starter, and it went out. It went out. And I learned quickly, it was a three-speed automatic, and I learned quickly that I could actually drop that the Mustang in, in second gear and pop the clutch on it, and it would start. Matter of fact, I went on dates that way. The date would push my Mustang, and, it would, it, I, and I would say, hey, can you push the car real kind of quick? And it, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just push it a little bit, and because you know you're not. If you're in South, if you're in Georgia, and you're not on a hill, then you know, and it's flat, then I needed someone to push it. So anyway, they they helped me get my my Mustang, you know, pushed and started, and I popped the clutch, and away we went. But I remember I wanted to go home, and I didn't have any money. No money. I was one of those guys in Emmanuel College that that. Um, I didn't come from a, a wealthy, wealthy home, but I, I remember, like, I didn't have a lot of money in the manual, and I remember standing, there were times when I stood in front of the Coke machine in the lobby in the boys' dorm, and I was like, I was like, I had two pennies, and it was like a nick, I was like a quarter for a drink. And I would just sit there, and I'd look at that machine, and I'm like, God, will you please turn these pennies into a quarter? I really, really want a Coke. And it never happened. And I, it was OE of little faith, I guess, I don't know. Um, but anyway, I, I, was, I wanted to go home, and I couldn't go home, and, and um, I, was, I, 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 was, I just prayed. I was like, God, I'm like, I, I really want to go home. i got to get my starter fixed in my car, and I don't have any money. And uh, if you know anything about Emmanuel College, um, from, the, from Wellens Hall straight over to the post office, there's like a little path. So if you get bored at Emmanuel College because there was nothing to do when I was there, you walked across that um, uh, that little path and you went across you'd walked over to the post office to check your box and usually there was nothing in it from my for me and but anyway I was like there, I don't have anything else to do everybody's going home I guess I got to stay at Emmanuel College I'll be the only one on campus which is rather boring but I remember I walked across there and I, I, I went in to my post office box and I put my key in and I opened it up and there was a there was a there was something in there and I was like hmm. What that? Yeah, I wonder what that is. So I opened the box up and I pulled it out, and it was the letterhead was from um, the Salvation Army. And I opened, I opened the the letter, I opened it up, and when I opened it up, I pulled out the letter, and there was something in the envelope. 
And the letter was basically saying, Cuddy, when we were cutting your check, we basically didn't pay you enough, and you did more hours than what you got paid. And there was a check for like $150 in that envelope. Now, here's the deal. That may not mean anything to you tonight, but at that time, that meant everything to me. And God, God supernatural. I'm telling you, man, I was like, I was floored. Like, God, I just prayed this. Can you, I mean, I'm just talking about life circumstances that, that God allows to happen in our lives just to like explode us, explode us. I, I could sit here tonight and you could too and talk about the, the, the moments in your life when God did something in you and through you and boom, there it was. And it just, all of a sudden, man, it's like you just experienced the goodness of God and you're like, oh man, he is so good. And you're just, your faith just explodes Answered prayers early in my walk, man, was a big, huge faith development. And you don't forget those things. You should never forget those things. Matter of fact, continually, God tells the, the leaders of the Israelites to continue to tell, tell them what I've done. 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 Remember what I've done. Remember, 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 remember. Don't forget what I've done. Because it increases our faith. The, fourth, the fifth one is serving in ministry. Um, what you do, uh, work at it with all your heart. Colossians 3, 23, 24. As working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you have received an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Serving in ministry. Therefore, look at 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It says, therefore, my brothers and sisters, stand Firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that you let your labor in the Lord is not in vain. What we do, we do for the Lord. Mark 9, 35, sitting down, Jesus called the disciples and said, anyone who wants to be first must be last and servant of all. Let me just say this about serving. There is something that God does when people step up and step out in faith to serve people. He does it. The greatest experiences come when we step up and say, yes, I'll help, I'll serve. Steps of faith are greeted with empowerment. Steps of serving, uh, uh, serving are meeting with blessings of God in other people's lives. It's amazing the faith, uh, faith prayers that we pray when we step out into the unknown. And we see God say, yeah, yeah, um, I, I don't know how to serve in the nursery, Miss Barbara, but I'm going to step out in faith and I'm, I'm going to do it. And, and, I want to, I want to, and, and God just meets you there. Or if it's in, in other areas of the church and you say, I'm going to step out and I'm going to do that. A lot of times when we, are given people, when we give people an opportunity to serve, many times people think it's about the act when really it's just about faith. It's really just about faith and seeing people move from, from point A to point B to point and onward. Faith exploding into people who are connected into ministry opportunities. Ministry in the church is about serving and growing in faith. It's moving from immaturity to maturity. That's why mission trips, in my opinion, are, are important. They're becoming a catalyst moment for people to see what God is doing around the world. If I could get teenagers on the mission field to see what God was doing, I never, I have never seen anybody in 20, I've been in church my whole life, 50, 54 years, 53 years. I, I've been in church my whole life. I got stamped IPHC on my diaper when I was like two years old or whatever, two weeks old, and I was in, I was in the nursery ever since then. But I have never met anybody that ever took a mission trip with the right motive that came back and was just like, man, that just didn't do it for me. Usually those individuals come back and they are rock fired up for Jesus. They're so like, oh my goodness, God is moving. When is the next trip? Sign me up. I want to go. And they'll go through the rigors of like trying to raise support and trying to get like, I need to get some money. I want to, I'm going to, I got to sell. If I got to sell my house, I'm going to, you know, that kind of faith. It's about, it's about seeing them move. It's about, it's about God revealing himself to what he's doing. They talk about these, and those, that's the funny thing. Those individuals, like, they grow up, and they've experienced God on those moments, and they never stop talking about them. And they always continue to reference them. Because why? Because that's where faith grew. That's where they saw God do something amazing in their life. That's where they met God in a very powerful, real way. Real way. 
Because why? Because God wants our faith to grow when we step out and we serve. And those things become catalyst moments for people. The gusher of faith and faith flowing people, or people who are talking or t- taking the opportunities to get uh, involved with the spreading of the gospel to the nations. I um we had a we had a group um we had a group of college guys just go to Atlanta um to uh, Passion, and if you know anything about Passion, it's a it's a meeting of college students. There were fifty five thousand college students, and. And Emmanuel, our, our, our um, college pastor and a simulation pastor was there, and he had a group. And he was there. I was watching it on, online, and there was a person there from an unreached people's group that was, um, they were translating the scripture into that language, and they had gotten um, to John 14, 6 in the translation. And what those guys, uh, Louis Giglio and what those guys did, they organized it so that he would write the translation of John, uh, John 14, 6 in front of every single one of those 55,000 students. So they had this big, long table out that had a big, white sheet of paper on it. And this guy, they've been working for months and months and months and on it. He goes over and he starts writing in that language. And if you know anything about John 14, 6, it says what? I am the way, the truth. Now, here's what happened. As he was writing that and he was getting to the end, all of a sudden, Emmanuel told me that that stadium came unglued. Those college kids went absolutely nuts. And they had started an app to raise funds to finish this project. And they needed, I think they needed about a million dollars to do it or whatever it was. It was some ridiculous number. And he said in the corner of that, a corner of that arena, all of a sudden, those college kids started like celebrating what was going on. And he said, and it spread all around that Mercedes-Benz arena. And by the time he finished, man, those college kids were clapping and going nuts. And, and he said, man, he said, it was like, he said it was like having goosebumps on you, like just to see the, the, the word of God translated. And you're talking about just a regular life event that got, and by the time that they finished, they had raised like over a million and a half dollars for the continued project of that because those college kids were giving their <laughs> giving money like crazy. But he told me, he, there's, there's another story he told me, just in his faith development, just in life, we were talking about weddings. Um, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to close with this. He, he said this, um, Emmanuel came to us from, from, actually, Emmanuel College, and he did an internship program with us, and um, he had a friend of his uh, that uh, was getting married, and he got asked, he got asked to do part of the ceremony at... Um, at a, at a wedding that was predominantly Hindu. And he, that's the kind of stuff that Emmanuel College never trained you for, but he, he's like, hey man, he met with Ryan, our pastor, and Ryan kind of gave him some steps that he, you, know, you need to go through. And, and part of that was, um, y- you know, regardless of what happens there, you need to preach the gospel in some way or some form. And Emmanuel was like, I don't, w- w- <laughs> What do you mean? And, he, and Ryan kind of walked him through what he needed to share and how he needed to share it in a respectful way at the wedding. And so Emmanuel said when he got there, uh, the other Hindu, there was a Hindu priest there from whatever God or whatever and whatever the temple was. And he said that that guy shook his hand very politely. They were very politely. And so it gets to the part of the ceremony in that wedding And all of a sudden, Emmanuel starts into his gospel presentation. And that Hindu priest stood up and tried to stop him. And he could not speak. He was coughing. He was coughing so bad, and Emmanuel did not stop. He kept going. He kept going, and he just just shared the love of Christ's atoning work. 
and how this couple can start their marriage the right way with God at the center of it. I mean, he just went for it. And this Hindu priest tried his best to talk words and he could not stop coughing. And so literally that Hindu priest sits down and Emmanuel finishes. And after it's over, he is, Emmanuel is completely blown away. And that couple comes up to him and thanks him for it. And, and they were like, that was awesome. Thank you so much. And there were other people that were at, the, at that wedding that came up to Emmanuel. And they were like, I don't, I'm not a Christian. I don't know anything about Christianity, but I need to know more about this Jesus that you're talking about. And Emmanuel came back from that moment. He came back from that, that happening. And you can just imagine, he was so afraid, but yet he stepped out in faith. And God met him there. And as he met him there, man, his faith just shot through the roof. Now, Emmanuel's not really afraid of anything anymore, really. He's not. He's just, he's just, he's, he, 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 he'll talk to strangers on the, on the street, people he's playing ball with. Emmanuel Robinson has led more people to our church over the last year and a half than anybody. And I really believe that's because God is doing something tremendous in his faith. So I just want to tell you, and I want to encourage you tonight, that, that we got we to have the Word of God in our lives. we got to have the right relationships in our lives. we got to let our faith grow and, and flow out of spiritual disciplines and our connections with, with the Lord. We've, we've got to have like, opportunities and life events. we got to have those things. we got to see those things for what they are. Don't be so busy in your life that you miss the moments in which God wants to grow your faith. Don't be so busy that you miss the opportunities for God to drop an incredible amount of faith growth in your life. And lastly, the serving. We got to have serving a part of our faith development because as we serve, we see God move and it increases our faith. Amen? Are you with me tonight? Are you here? Yeah. Why don't you stand? I don't know why the Lord laid that on my heart. I was going to go in another direction. I even told Linda on the mountain what I was going to do, and I didn't do it. <laughs> I went with this. Because I believe that your community needs to see people full of faith. They need to see people full of passion for God. I talked about that this morning. And I believe that like Pastor Barbara said, I, I, am not, I think I'm here because really there's a divine appointment. And I don't know whether it's, if it's just, a, hey, I just want to remind you of this or whether God really wants to ignite something in you. And he wants to do something he wants, to, he wants to grow your faith. We don't, we don't ever arrive in that. We don't ever get to the place where we, oh, we've got so much faith, we don't need any more, Jesus. We got it all figured out. That's not how that works. Because if you want to go deeper with the Lord, He will take you there. He said He would. And as that happens in your life, We can trust him. We can trust him. And just real simple tonight, can we just ask the Lord to ignite our passion? Can we ask the Lord tonight just to do another work of faith in our hearts? Can we do that tonight? Why don't you just, why don't you just take your hands and just hold them out tonight like this right here, right, right where you are. And can we just ask God to renew our passion? Can we ask God tonight to do something in our faith, to give us 
the desire to step out and to connect and to read his word and, and to seek revelation in his word and to, and to connect with God-directed relationships that he has for us. And everybody that's watching on Facebook right now, if you're seeing this, same thing. I just want you like right where you are, just whether you're in the mainland, your east coast, wherever you are, God wants to do a deeper work with your passion. He wants you to chase the right things. And he wants to deepen your faith walk. And he'll do it if you just ask. Can we do that out of your own mouth tonight? Can we do that just out of your own mouth tonight as I pray? Father God, we love you tonight, God. God, and we thank you, God, for your word that changes us, God. And it makes us more like you. And God, I pray tonight that everybody in this room, God, whatever, whatever we've wrapped ourselves around in, in, in 2020 or 2021, God, but in 2022, God, on this Sunday night in March, God, God, I pray, God, a revelation, God, of your love flowing into our hearts and out of our hearts, God. And God, may we, may we walk with passion, God, for you. God, may there be a renewing of that into our hearts and our minds, God, tonight. God, in, our, in your Holy Spirit, God, may it, may it anoint us, God, to do the things that you've called us to do, Lord. To be the church that you've called us to be. To be the dad that you've called me to be or the, the mom that you've called me to be, God. God, the uncle or the grandmother or, or whatever, God. Whoever we are, God, in the positions and relationships that we have with others, God, may they see us passionately in love with you, Lord. Not through what we say, God, but how we live our lives. And God, I pray right now, God, that just your anointing, God, will fall on this church, God. And people will fall radically in love again with you, O oh Lord. And God, may it be a deep and rooted love, out of, uh, talking out of Ephesians, Lord, tonight. God, something that you reach in and deep down, God, you do a surgery, God, in our hearts, God. And Lord, I pray tonight, God, Lord, that we, God, will, will allow God love to flow, God, like it's never, like it's never flown before, God. Just out of our own lives, God, people that we meet, God, in Maui, in the grocery store, God. God, just everyday lives, God, our neighbors, God, whoever it is, God, may they see the love of Christ. May they see the anointing of God in our hearts and our lives, oh God. And God, I pray tonight, Lord. God, I pray that every single one of us, God, will serve you, will connect with you, Give us the right desires in those things, God. God, I pray these catalyst things into our lives, God, to help grow our faith, God, in the simplest ways. You said you would do it, God, and we claim it tonight in Jesus' name. And if you believe that tonight, will you say amen? amen. Come on, will you say that tonight? Will you say amen? amen? Oh, God, we love you tonight, God. We love you tonight. And we give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Can we give the Lord a clap offering of praise? Can we do that? I just want us to be quiet right here. And I know we're maybe going a little over time. But I want to honor... Pastor Rob, for coming. Uh, we asked if Pastor Cuddy could do this lesson, and he didn't have to come. But he came all the way from Kula to be here with us, and there's a reason. And I want us to honor him by listening to the testimony he has, because if your children and grandchildren are going to live up the, out their faith and be strong, Christians as adults. It has to be with a purpose and a plan that you make. You need to purpose in your heart that you would like to see your children 
serving Jesus and really thriving. Pastor Rob, would you come? Because I'm going to tell you a little bit about him and his wife. You met his wife. They ministered to us. We were really good friends. But they have two sons. The first one was a miracle son. I didn't know about that. But Ethan and Ariel have grown up to be mighty men of God. One is a doctor. One is an engineer. They're still kind of in training. But uh, when we had our school opening, and they live in Kula, our school had no reputation. Uh, it was just that we were going to do it. They sent their two sons to our school because they wanted, I'm sure, for them to be surrounded. They're heading home now, many of them. Why have the Jewish people maintained their identity when they didn't even have a homeland for thousands of years and so many times the enemy wanted to wipe them out because they honored God, taught them as Deuteronomy says, when you're sitting down, rising up, write them over, over your foreheads, your doorposts and everything. And I know that this couple did that. And so I'd like for him to close us in prayer tonight, but just tell us a little bit about your testimony, how purposefully you brought up your two sons, that one of them is in Kansas and he has his Facebook ministry or something. Tell us, take about uh, five, ten minutes and then do our closing. Okay, maybe less, maybe less. So relax, everybody. You got a Jewish dad talking about his son, so it could, it sounds dangerous, but just take a couple of minutes. We are grateful for everyone who spoke into our son's lives. We were just talking about that on Friday night, how it is people like Pastor Barbara, uh, Sylvia that ran the school, and other people, and it just made such a profound difference. Yes, both our sons are serving God. Our older son, Ariel, is 27 years old. He's graduated medical school now. He's in training, doing research, working toward a residency in ear, nose, and throat specialty. And maybe he'll come back here to Maui and be a doctor. We don't know, but we're very, very proud of him. He's a remarkable young man. I never saw in him the potential, but we did see, or I should say, we, we tried to steer them in a direction of absolutes, that there were things that were right, things that were wrong, things that were of value, things that were not of value things that were helpful, things that were harmful. The day came to me when I realized that I had a job, and that job was to guide our boys. Now, before I thought of it as a job, I wanted to be their friend, I wanted to help them, I wanted to be their advisor, but I actually have a job, which means I need to correct them when they're going in the wrong direction. And I took it seriously, and I explained it to them before I did any discipline. I said, this is my job. I've got to do this. Uh, Ariel was remarkable. He was a very compliant young man, and so it took no effort. We thought we were just good parents. We didn't realize he came that way. And then we were humbled because God sent us a second son, Ethan, who was absolutely the opposite. No matter what we did, we could not get him to agree to our direction. But we were persistent, his mother and I valued education and we persisted in directing him. He was a quitter. He would say, no, this is too hard, I don't wanna do it. This is too difficult, I don't wanna do it. And he was extraordinarily capable. He was the son that I thought was more capable. But he had no vision for that and we would not let him. That was our job. His mother and I took it very seriously. We were gonna keep him on the track. So. When he wanted to drop out of calculus in high school, he said, no, you could do it. There are students that are doing it. You're just as capable as they. So we did that, and now he's finished his master's degree in chemical engineering. And as soon as they discover oil on Maui, he will be back to drill for it. Amen. He's built this contraption that will cure the world of global warming. And so it's uh, in process wrapping that research project up. Well, I don't know if it'll cure the world, but it's, a, it's an environmentally uh, uh, worthwhile project in that he is separating gases that have 
that are harmful to the environment that have never been separated before in the history of chemical engineering. So he's building this thing, he's very excited, and he uh, may go on to his PhD, may not. He's in the field of chemical engineering. But his passion is evangelism. He has a Facebook ministry. If you can friend Ethan Finberg, you will be blessed. He is outspoken on our liberal college campuses for the Lord. He, wear, he makes his own T-shirts. But he'll say things like, no sex outside of marriage. That's his idea of a good T-shirt to wear around the University of Kansas. And uh, he had another one printed, unvaccinated male looking for unvaccinated female. And a uh, godly young man uh, has now started a ministry of discipleship. He has 30 young college men who come every week to a breakfast where he opens the word of God and they interact and he encourages them. And he's just done an, an amazing job. I did not see it in him. I didn't see it. We concerned ourselves with the little things, and God took care of the big things. We emphasized what we could do as parents, our job, and as a result of that, God took that and multiplied it. You know, there's an amazing application of that verse in Malachi about tithing. It says if we tithe, that God will pour us out a blessing that we don't have room to contain. And Sister Barbara, we got a lot of room to contain blessings, right? We're talking about bank accounts and real estate and so on. I mean, we could enjoy that. But the take on this that I'd like to challenge you with is if you're faithful to the Lord in this verse, if you bring the tithes and offerings into the story, he'll pour you out a blessing you in our room to contain. In other words, it flows over your generation to the next generation. And I've seen that. With pastors' children, they are just blessed extraordinarily. We're here in Hawaii, right, where the great missionaries came and released upon the world the world's greatest revival. Their sons and their grandsons were not necessarily of that same passion about sharing the gospel, but I can tell you they received a blessing that their parents could not contain. There's a, there's a truth to that. We've seen that in our lives, so we expect both our sons to... Remember mom and dad when they make their blessings known and they go on to their specialties and make their contributions in the world. And we uh, train them. We train them in the way of, uh, of the principles of God. We put a little Jewish emphasis on it. I remember sitting our two boys down and, and I said, sons, you know, the law of Moses says that the firstborn gets twice the inheritance of the secondborn. And they're looking at me and nodding and so on. Of course, they were only uh, four years old and two years old, so they didn't really care. They didn't know what an inheritance was. But I decided if I started early, then when it came time for me to write out my will and I said that Ariel gets twice the inheritance of Ethan, they would be prepared. <laughs> but that's what we did. We instilled whatever values that we had and. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about it, but they are both serving. Don't, don't think that they don't need your prayers because they do. They're, they're facing challenges, but uh, they're both serving the Lord. We're very proud of them. Thank you for this opportunity. That was unexpected. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We have a generation to reach. I thank you for my brother's challenge. We want to be refired for you. There's a great call of evangelism. We're living in times of uncertainty, disruption. Probably the greatest threat is not Russia. It's not a virus. The greatest threat is the disintegration of our Judeo-Christian values in society. People are without a direction. Multitudes in the valley of decision. Lord, let us be that voice when crying in the wilderness to make straight the paths of the Lord. We thank you for it, Lord. In your wonderful name, Jesus, amen. Amen and good night. Thank you for joining. We'll see you next Sunday night.